Oh, hi there. What is your philosophy for writing? What core beliefs animate the way you express your ideas through the written word? Today we are going to learn and apply Herbert Spencer's view on the subject. Now, Spencer was a 19th century philosopher, biologist, anthropologist, cultural critic, kind of an everyman, kind of a renaissance man. And during his lifetime, he became one of the most respected intellectuals in English-speaking academia. He knew the Darwins, he was an early advocate of the theory of evolution, and he is uh, one of the creators of the idea of social Darwinism, and he coined the phrase survival of the fittest, which you've probably heard of. That's not what we're going to talk about today, though. What we're going to talk about today is 1852 short book called The Philosophy of Style. He wrote this when he was only 32 years old, so before he got into a lot of his other philosophy stuff, he was already a pretty experienced writer and was writing about writing. So he begins his philosophy of style with, there can be little question that good composition is far less dependent upon acquaintance with its laws than upon practice and natural aptitude. He who daily reads and hears well-framed sentences will naturally more or less tend to use similar ones. So he's kind of backing up what I've said on this channel before, that you become a good writer by reading and writing, right? By reading widely and broadly and deeply, you get a lot of good stuff feeding into your mind and then practicing what you're learning from your reading in your writing on a daily basis. That's how you become a good writer. So certainly backs me up there. I'm going to add my caveat before we go into his ideas about style and the way he advocates for them, that there is no one right style. I've said this before as well, but I always got to add my caveat. There's no one right way to write. What Ernest Hemingway did work for him, what F. Scott Fitzgerald did work for him, what Virginia Woolf did work for her, and what E.L. James did work for her. You know, so... There's no one right way to do it. We're looking for the most effective way to deliver your voice and your message, your story, your idea to your audience. But these are just some tools that you might want to consider when doing that. And ultimately, that is the purpose of style. That's its end goal, is to choose and arrange your words and sentences and the elements of language in such a way to most effectively deliver your idea to your audience. So whether your goal is to scare, anger, frustrate, or provoke lust in your audience or your reader, you'll find that certain stylistic choices are more effective for that than others. So Spencer's first injunction for that is a strong one. As I've said before, you don't become a good writer by reading a rule book, by following the rules, quote unquote, of good writing. You become a good writer by reading a lot and writing a lot. But the principles of sound style that Spencer talks about can help you as a roadmap for what to look for in your reading and writing practice. And for Spencer, and this is something that you might want to consider as well, the most important aspect of style, the core of his philosophy of style, is the principle of economy. What he's talking about here is not the cost per word, literally, in terms of dollar amount. He's talking about the economy, the cost of your reader's energy and attention. According to Spencer, a reader or listener has at each moment but a limited amount of mental power available. To recognize and interpret the symbols presented to him requires part of this power. To arrange and combine the images suggested requires a further part. And only that part which remains can be used for realizing the thought conveyed. Hence, the more time and attention it takes to receive and understand each sentence, the less time and attention can be given to the contained idea, and the less vividly will that idea be conceived. So the harder you make your readers work just to understand what the heck you're saying, the less time they're going to really get, be able to give to what you're actually saying. The more time they're going to be trying to interpret the symbols that you're using, the words and the ways you've arranged them. What this means is that as a writer, it is your job to respect your reader. Respect your reader's time, their attention, their effort, their energy. If you write in a way that makes readers waste time and energy, they're not going to want to read you for long. 
Carrying out the metaphor that language is the vehicle of thought, there seems reason to think that in all cases the friction and inertia of the vehicle deduct from its efficiency, and that in composition the chief, if not the sole thing to be done, is to reduce this friction and inertia to the smallest possible amount. So when we're writing, we're always symbolizing things. Words are symbols. So we're always having, the reader is always having to take our words and interpret it in their brains and change it into what those symbols mean in our brains. They're always having to create the image, to recreate the image that you're creating, an image, and you're putting it into words for the reader to take those words and recreate their own image. You're basically giving the reader their own movie to see. But... The way you choose your word, which words you choose, and how you arrange them is going to determine how easily they're able to see that movie, how well they're able to see it, how well they're able to understand what you're trying to get across, and thus how much they're able to get out of it. So in practical terms, what principles can help us to achieve this economy of the reader's attention? Today we're just going to focus on... Spencer's take on words, particular word choices. He also goes into sentences and he goes into different arrangements and variety. But for right now, we're just going to take that first step and talk about the words you choose. And then we're going to put this into practice. So in terms of the words we choose, and this is all for people who are writing in English right now, that's who Spencer's writing for. He says that you want to prefer, as a rule, Saxon English words to Latin English words. Right, the Saxon words are older, they've been in the language longer, they're more Germanically derived, and so they're less like the Romance words that are more Spanish or French or Italian origins that go back to the Latinate language. Basically, the Saxon words are smaller, simpler, and they're usually learned earlier in life by those of us who are raised English speakers. So for instance, I have is preferable to I possess. She wants is clearer than she desires. And for the love of God, never use utilize when use will do, which is almost every case. As Spencer says, the earliest learnt and oftenest used words will, other things equal, call up images with less loss of time and energy than their later learnt synonyms. So the Saxon words that we learn earlier in life are going to be easier to call images to the mind for than the Latinate words that we learn later in life. We all learn use a long time before we learn utilize. So Saxon English, in addition to us learning it earlier and therefore having it clearly fixed in our heads, is also preferable due to its brevity. If it be an advantage to express an idea in the smallest number of words, then will it be an advantage to express it in the smallest number of syllables. The shortness of Saxon words becomes a reason for their greatest force, their greater force. So generally, most of the time, other things being equal to, to communicate clearly, to communicate clearer, you want to choose shorter words, the shortest word possible for the meaning you're trying to express. Now, as with any writing rule, this one has an ex is exception. And Spencer himself points out those exceptions. A word which in itself embodies the most important part of an idea to be conveyed, especially when that idea is an emotional one, may often with advantage be a polysyllabic word. Thus, it seems more forcible to say it is magnificent than it is grand. The word vast is not so powerful as one as stupendous. Calling a thing nasty is not so effective as calling it disgusting. You can see he's got a point there, right? If you use longer Latinate words sparingly and use them at points of emotional emphasis, emotional impact, they're going to have a stronger impact, just like a black dot is going to show up a lot clearer on a white background than it is on a black background. So a longer, more Latinate word is going to have a stronger impact. It's going to show up more on a background of simpler, more straightforward language. A word of several syllables admits of more emphatic articulation. And as emphatic articulation is a sign of emotion, the unusual impressiveness of the thing it is named is implied by it. So the unusual impressiveness of the emotion is implied by the longer or Latinate word. 
But again, to have their desired emotional impact, the longer Latinate words should be the exception rather than the rule. The principle of economy still generally prefers the Saxon simpler words. In addition to preferring the Saxon to the Latin and the shorter to the longer, in respecting the economy of the reader's attention, you should as much as possible use specific rather than general terms. The reason for this is as Spencer says, that concrete terms produce more vivid impressions than abstract ones, and should, when possible, be used instead. I covered this in some degree of detail in my video on imagery, but Spencer kind of backs me up on the same point here. When an abstract word is used, the bearer or reader has to choose from his stock of images, one or more, by which he may figure it to himself the genus mentioned. So in other words, when you give somebody an abstract term, they have to come up with specific examples of it themselves. If, by employing a specific term, an appropriate image can be at once suggested, an economy is achieved, and a more vivid impression produced. It's the difference between saying a character is cruel and saying that the character is an executioner of puppies. Which one gives you a clearer mental picture? So words, of course, are only one example of the principle of economy in use. Spencer moves on to applying this principle of economy to sentences and to figures of speech before moving on to talk about the need for variety and the necessity of pretty much violating every one of his rules on occasion to spice things up and hold the reader's interest without draining them. So if you guys enjoyed this lesson and found it helpful, I'd be happy to talk more about the philosophy of style. I love talking about philosophy of just about anything. That was my undergrad major. So please let me know in the comments down below what you think of this. And if you want to hear more about sentences and figures of speech and how to incorporate a stronger style with those, I would be happy to come back to this topic and address that in a future video. So please like the video and subscribe to the channel as well so you don't miss a video coming up. So for now, look at a piece of your own writing and reread it with a critical eye. Are your word choices effective? Are you using longer words where shorter ones might do? Using Latinate words where Saxon ones would be more effective? Are you are there places where a long word interjected could possibly have a greater emotional impact, particularly if you surround it with shorter words? Are you wasting the reader's attention with lots of longer or more abstract words? Or you could be using shorter and or more concrete words. Are there points of emotional intensity where you could use a more complex word to a greater effect? Especially if it's surrounded by shorter, simpler words. Give it a try and see how this helps you develop your style and voice. And until next time, guys, good luck and good writing. Peace.